going to introduce uh, Ivan Foslu, um, who, like your talk on my apologies, is, <laughs> okay, what is the point of object orientation? Thank you very much. Thank you. I presented here last year on our little project called Real, and then earlier this year in Europython, I did a more technical version of that as well. So I thought it's time for a, a new topic. And I picked this topic because I work with a lot of old systems that are very big and, and have to give people advice as to how to fix them. So I see a lot of bad stuff. And I think a lot of this comes from the fact that there are a bunch of fundamental simple things about OO that people don't apply. I'm not quite sure why. So I hope this is going to show you fundamental stuff, but maybe in a different light than you've seen them before. Or maybe I can remind you of it. Can I just see, are there people here who don't understand it at all or has never really worked with OO stuff before? Not really. Okay. That means I can go faster. So, a lot of people think that OO is all about the, the mechanisms that a programming language actually give you. And they taught, if you go into Google and, and look for tutorials and stuff, that's what's being taught. Although that's not really how you should look at it. Because the whole idea of object-oriented methods is that you should start with a conceptual model of your problem domain. Think there a lot, how you understand your problem domain. Then map that to code in a program language. And if, if you're happy or lucky, you've got a programming language that supports those mechanisms. Uh, you don't need that, but it helps a bit. So it's actually a much smaller part of, of the bigger picture. And that's sort of the message I want to get across. I don't know. If, if you look at a, at a program, how do you actually understand it? What does it mean to understand a program? And I actually think that many people understand it like this old game where one thing triggers another, triggers another, and something happens or not. And if something goes wrong, then you actually have to go back 20, 30 steps to figure out what actually happened. To be able to do that and to be able to debug stuff like that, means that, well, to me, you probably need that whole design in your head, and you need to know what happens where. Of course, software looks a little bit more complicated. I found this nice flowchart on Google. So to keep this in your head is a little bit more challenging if something goes wrong somewhere, right? I did a pseudo-scientific thumbsuck on this one, and I sort of came up with a figure that this represents around about 100 lines of code. So what do you think 180,000 lines of code would look like? So this is really what it's all about. What does it mean to understand that? And how do you, how do you sort of exert your, your powers of understanding on, on a system like that? Luckily, we've evolved this amazing ability to understand stuff because we have to deal with a lot of input every day and we need to to, oper to make decisions as to you know, whether what these things represent to us and how we should actually respond. And uh, I like to call it an understanding. It's not reality, you have to remember that, but it's how we perceive it. A conceptual model is all about that. It's all about how do we consciously understand things and explain them to one another. So I'm going to start with the basics of what is a concept. If you have the concept of chair in your head, you can actually store a bunch of knowledge about that thing in one place. So, for example, the fact that you know if you find a chair, you could climb on it and use it to change a light bulb, right? That's one thing. Or you can throw it at the line if you get chased. You, if this concept applies to two objects in your awareness, it's a, a great compression algorithm because now all the stuff you know about chairs only needs to be stored once in your head. You don't have to know that for every single chair you come across. And importantly, concepts have definitions. So the definition tells you whether that concept applies or not, which means it doesn't apply to desks. You can't throw that at the line. But a really, really great thing about this also and about definitions 
is if another object actually enters your awareness which you've never seen before, automatically, if your definition is smart enough and you can apply it to that new object, you have all the stuff you've learned before already available for use with this new thing. So I think it's actually quite amazing. The, the other half of concepts is that you can see them as a set. Because a concept can be the set of things to which it applies. And this is where the, the mathematical foundation of, of our comes from, from set theory that's behind this. I don't want to say too much about that. I want to tell you basically only two things. Because in your head, mine at least, I don't have a linear list of concepts. I've got an intricate structure of these things. And the intricate structure is uh, basically built up from two, two building blocks. The first one comes from the fact that we can have subsets. So office chair might be a concept, which is, in fact, a subset of chair. So everything I know about chairs also is valid for office chairs, but I can say extra stuff about office chairs. So that's the first little bit of structure that, that we can use. The other part is that we can connect objects from one set to another set. Oh, this is all extremely mathematical. Note my Venn diagrams, eh? So <clears throat> we can, for example, say that this particular chair is connected or assigned to that particular desk. And we like to do this sort of thing in real life. And if you take all the stuff on that slide away and you end up just with the two connections, those are objects too. And there are two of them, so I can call them a set if I want to. Which means that I can call this a different concept, the concept of assignment of desks to chairs. Or one, one thing about these relationships that we often like to specify is this idea of multiplicity. In other words, I might want to state that chairs can be only assigned to, to one desk at a time, but a desk can have many chairs assigned to it, right? Just a little bit of terminology, this is what we call multiplicity. And of course, if you, if you carry on with Venn diagrams, and uh, then things get a bit complicated. So for this reason, people came up with a lot of different notations and finally standardized on this thing called UML in, in the 90s somewhere. And this then obviously just says exactly the same thing. We, we conceptually have this thing called a chair, Office chairs are chairs. It's the same thing, they are chairs, but they're a little bit different because we can say more stuff about them. For example, that they can be assigned to desks and exactly how the multiplicity works. I personally have the opinion that you should be warned, though, if you use UML, if you go and read that book, because this notation has got a lot of details that I feel really defeat the purpose if you use all of that. I, I prefer to stick to simple bits of the notation like this. Of course, we don't use chairs and desks really in programs. We, we typically more deal with intangible concepts. And this is a real world example from the financial industry. These things exist purely because we say, let's agree there is something like a portfolio which is the thing in which I keep track of which investment instruments I own. All of those things don't really, no, well, none of them really exist in real world. Just keep this in mind. And then something that people don't always keep in mind is that in a conceptual model, we also have the case where concepts overlap with one another, sets intersect. So I can be both a person and an investor at the same time which is a perfectly valid thing, a uh, way of thinking about the world. And similarly, I, how I am classified will change over time. I can be not employed and later on be employed, hence also be an employee and also be an investor. Why not? This is how we think. This is how con conceptual models work. And I'm going to have to change terminology now. So also be aware that concepts, to be able to communicate about them, we need to attach labels, right? So I've introduced the concept of a concept here, and I called it concept. That's just the label I attach to it. The more correct term is actually type. 
But these two are just different labels, so they're synonyms for the same thing. So if I use type from now on, I mean concept as defined up to now. The, the more interesting sort of stuff starts happening when things change. For example, when you want to load a bunch of prices from a price file, and that's perhaps going to create a bunch of prices and connect them to a bunch of unit trusts, for example. This is also a, a real-world example. So conceptually, there's a thing called an operation. We're not saying how it works, but we're saying, I understand what it means for uh, prices to be loaded. And this will affect a number of other objects. So this is how we, we define the concept of an operation. While an, uh, an operation operates on a bunch of objects, right? But an operation also needs an implementation, which typically you'll specify in terms of an algorithm. And that's what a method really is. So a method or, or an operation can be implemented by one or more methods. Depending on the situation, you might want to use a, a different method at all. So a, a quick summary, just so we can use the notation a bit. So we know there's something like an object. We know that a type is a, speci a special type of object which classifies others and can have subtypes at least. Other things too, but we know that. We know that a relation or a relationship is actually a special kind of type which links other objects, two or more objects with one another. And also that an operation is something that changes, operates on a bunch of other objects, one or more, and that there are many methods that could implement an operation. But you can sit with a head full of concepts, right? And it's still not the same as this flowchart, which is actually how your program is going to be executed at the end of the day. So it's not really the same thing. So how is this going to help you? Well, <clears throat> you can start blocking out parts of this thing and say, well, you know, that blue block over there is actually how I'm going to parse CSV files. And this is actually just one method of the operation of parsing files. And you can carry on with this and on with this so that at the end of the day, you're able to actually focus on very small parts of this thing. Yeah, we're just saying, well, a price file is a thing with a price format. This is something I can explain to someone, right? And maybe that's all you need to know today. You don't need to have this entire system in your head. You can say that, oh, zoom in and say there's, there's two formats, actually, Excel and CSV. And if you really need to, you can zoom in more and say, so how do I parse CSV files? And here's my method for doing that, right? Very naive one, by the way. So how does this translate to Python? I said before that it's, oh, oh, it's not about the programming bits, about the supporting mechanisms that we get to learn about first, I suppose. It's about the conceptual model, and you've now seen what that looks like, and, and mapping that to code. Traditionally, there are sort of two, two ways to do this uh, in OOP languages. The one is classical object-oriented programming. The other one is prototype-based, as is used by, by JavaScript. Python sits on the classical side. So, OK, in Python, this very flexible concept of types is actually mapped to the idea of a class, or the, the implementation of a class. And classes are quite a bit more restrictive than conceptual models, as you've seen. Classes in this classical model is one place where you can write your code. And you can use it as a cookie cutter, basically, to stamp out many instances that all look the same and can all use that same code. But the, the one big restriction, obviously, is once you have a class, that instance is of that class only. So you can't have this thing where multiple types actually classify a particular instance. So that's a, a severe limitation that we have to deal with when we get to programming languages. I just had to put some Python code on here as well, of course, uh, just with an empty class investment instrument. And I just had to show you also that I'm not lying about terminology because the type of that 
instance there is of class investment instrument. But remember, think concept now all the time. To, to deal with relationships, we have something equally very, very restrictive in the world. And that is called an attribute. So attributes, all they can do is, firstly, an attribute belongs to an instance. I've got three instances here of uh, investment instrument. And an attribute is like a one-way pointer with a name to another instance somewhere else. That's all we really have to represent relationships. So anything we want to do with relationships has to be built on, on top of this. Obviously, uh, I don't know if there are people here. I see lots of new people came in, so I don't know if they've seen this in Python. To do just for for that case, you just use dotted notation on the instance, right, to reference the the attribute. Luckily, we have something called a method in Python, and this is exactly also the methods that I've talked about. Python methods are really nothing but Python functions, and again, they have a bit of a restriction because methods are declared within the context of a class, so all of a sudden you're forced to index your methods by class. This is not something that, that from a conceptual modeling point of view, needs to be so, but to be able to implement stuff, uh, we do that. The, the idea of an operation is sort of still there, but not very explicitly, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later. So there's a Python method. Uh, once again, methods become attributes on an object, so you could actually call it like that on an instance. Python just adds a bit of syntactic sugar for us, so that if you call a method on an instance without arguments, it will automatically pass it in as the first arg. So there's not really much magic happening there. Of course, especially in this case where you use classes as cookie cutters, you would like your instances to be, to be properly initialized and whole once they're created. So once again, just in case there are people here who don't know this stuff, you, that's what the init method is for. It gets called automatically when you create stuff. And this one, so for subtyping, we have, again, a quite limiting implementation called inheritance. Inheritance, as you all know, this is Python 3 code, by the way. If this class inherits from that class, it just means that all of those methods could just as well have been defined here too. So it gets all of those methods too. Not quite the same thing as we would mean with a conceptual model where we would say that the unit, everything you know about this stuff, the definition, etc., applies to, to this guy as well. But this is how we can map it to code. And at least we can do things like make sure, ask questions like, is it an instance? And see, oh, yes, a unit trust fund is an instance of investment instrument as well. Now, th this whole idea of an operation is actually very important. Here, I've got an example of an operation that I call PARS. And once again, remember operation just meaning conceptually, what does it do, not how does it do it. So parsing could mean, oh, you must get stuff out of a file and give it to me, just the info, so that I don't have to understand about the file format or whatever. And if you have, for example, two different file formats, you might want to parse the one differently than you do the other one, right? In Python, what you do is you would put two methods on these two things, and you would use the same name for them. And that's actually how you say, listen, these two methods are two methods, but of the same operation. They're two different implementations of the same thing, logically. Why this is a good thing is it means you can write code like this. If you know that a price file has a file format, you can actually say price file dot format dot parse this thing and deal with stuff. That's all you need to do. You're here thinking in terms of operations, because you actually don't care which method is going to be executed. Python will automatically pick the right one, of course, but I want to show you what it would look like if you didn't have that. 
right? Now you would have needed ifs and things and dealt with scenarios that actually never really happen, etc. And these small things add up. So a lot of people talk about design. I thought it's a good idea to just define it. Conceptual models look like this. So I could be a person and an employee and an investor at the same time, and this can change during my lifetime. How do you implement something like this? We can't, given what you've seen conceptual models look like and given what we can do in a programming language, this is not possible. But what you can do is say, but can't I take this understanding of mine and change it a bit to a different one, a different conceptual model that will allow me to get the same job done? And you can. For example, you can say, well, a person is always a person, right? But a person can have many roles. And let's say there are roles employee, uh, em yeah, employee and investor. So a person could have those at the same time, and then you can be a person and an employee and an investor at the same time, right? So this is what design is all about. How do you take that stuff and map it into something like this that you can easily implement? Importantly, though, this is still a conceptual model. So those are still things that you can use to explain to someone how you understand your problem domain. Here's a, a real-world example for you from an unnamed client. I really, really have tried very hard, but I cannot explain this to anyone. Um, what this is about is uh, an insurance company that sell uh, insurance benefits as a package to people, and they need to work out commission for their brokers. And this is all about how do you work out commission. I'm not even going to try because if you just look at some of these concepts, what does a quote fees commissions mean to you? I, I, so it's really very difficult. I sat with this thing for quite some time, going through the code. Uh, it was quite a bit of hard work. Got me to this. So in this particular model, I can, I can explain this a bit better because I can say, listen, there's such a thing as a quote scenario. We're going to give a quote with many different scenarios in. In a particular scenario, there are these benefits, right? And I can say a, a, a quote is for a particular product always, and that different products have different commission scales on which we will work out commission. And I can say benefits in a particular scenario get bundled together so that the commission on them gets worked out in the same way for that particular bundle. Um, do you, do you see the difference between this and the previous one? This is actually useful. It conveys meaning. And in that way, it structures your code because the code is now forced to, to be indexed according to this understanding of it. A favorite of mine is that people tend to abuse inheritance quite a lot because it's easy. You know, you just inherit from that class and you also have that code available and it works, right? What you have to realize when you inherit from something is that you're saying that this concept that I declare now is a, uh, that other thing. So uh, what an object table is in this example is it is uh, a visual thing. This is also a real world example, by the way, from another client of mine. An object table is a, basically a table that you see on the screen and its rows contains objects and its columns have uh, contain the attributes or some attributes of those objects. So it displays you a bunch of unit trust funds with their prices or whatever. So they had that thing and then decided, well, they need now filters on this thing to say, listen, I only want to see prices between five rands and 10 rands or whatever. So they created this thing, an object table with filters, because that was the quickest thing to do. And then later on, they had this requirement that, oh, but you might want to actually filter it by date. So to only see things between, you know, the beginning of this month and the end of the next. So they inherited again and create an object table by date. You can see where this is heading. It sort of works, and anyone can argue that that is a valid concept. Con no, no concept can really be argued to be invalid, but some concepts are better than others at explaining stuff. And you can rethink this very easily. You could say, 
you know, instead of saying that an object table will, with filters is a concept, why don't you say that an object table can have zero or more filters? And based on that, you know, do your thing. That's one way of doing it. The other way is to say, listen, let's say we've got this thing called a report, and this is composed by an object table and a bunch of filters. So there's, there's always more than one way to think about stuff. The important thing is that what I often see is that people end up with stuff that's more difficult to explain and conveys very little meaning. I have to give you another one just to bash myself as well. Uh, because in, in our own code in real, we, for example, uh, had this thing, an unordered list, which represents, uh, which is a, an HTML unordered list. And then we built menus and we said, oh, a menu is an unordered list, because that's how we thought about it then. And, and you don't notice these little things, but conceptually, is a menu an unordered list? Not at all. Uh, it would be much better if we did it this way. And in fact, we, we've recently been forced to change it because we now want menus that display themselves this way in Bootstrap and that way with something else. So we, we actually had to go this route and, and fix this up. I, most of this talk, I, the beginning part that uh, many of you now unfortunately missed, I got from a book that's really good, but it's out of print. So last time I checked actually on Amazon, there were still many second-hand copies of it available. And even though the, the simple stuff is really simple, if you go into this thing and, and deeper into that book, you'll see that quite complicated uh, concepts are explained there and, and how these things work and how you can restructure them, etc. And then obviously, uh, two books from Martin Fowler. If you want to know what design is good and what design is bad, have a look at the refactoring book. I think it's really uh, good for that purpose. Because these things take exercise and, and practicing to, to, to learn how to do them nicely. The other book that I really also recommend is the Analysis Patterns book, also from Martin Fowler. That's a little bit more tricky to understand. It's, it, uh, you're not going to read it before breakfast one morning. But uh, I, I think that's a very, very cool place to go as well. If you want to talk about this stuff, you're welcome to come and do it maybe on, on our mailing list or email me directly. Uh, but then that's it. Well, thanks very much, Ivan. Um, any questions? Thanks, um, Ivan. Um, would you say that writing code in, the, in a different way or in a better way makes your testing easier? Yeah, is that a leading question? Um, one of the problems that we always get with, with big old systems is people say, oh, it's a mess, there are lots of quality problems, and if you work on it, it takes a long time and whatever. So the first thing you want to do is refactor it, right? Which you can't really do if you don't have tests. So it's a, it's a huge big problem then because if you write tests for code that isn't structured according to how you understand the world, your tests tend to be very unmaintainable. And if you change stuff, you have to change your tests, etc., etc. So if you have a neat conceptual design, it's actually very easy to say, well, this fact belongs there. And now for the follow-up. <laughs> Can you go back to the slide that you had there with the, um, the different implementations of your CSV reader? We had the ifs and the thens and that. This one. Yes. So would you, wouldn't you say that this is quicker to write than thinking about it and doing it different? I mean, what's, what's a technical date? Is this real technical date? Because my product is delivered before Friday. Well... I don't think it's possible to provide an ultimate answer to that one because this might be enough for where you are today. It depends on how much it's going to cost you to do it differently today, I suppose, and how much you want to invest in your future design. What I'm used to is systems that are 10 years old. 
and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm personally really investment oriented. Stay at the back. Uh, in that code where the menu was inheriting a list, um, they had another diagram next to it. Uh, yeah. Mm, so what's this relation now? What, are you, what is that representation, the solution that's better than inheriting in an ordered list? Well, what's happening here is I can say that a menu is composed of an ordered list and maybe other things. Composed of, is that not the same as inheriting? Not at all. Oh. Because inheriting means is a. So, for example, let me tell you the example with, that we had. Is We had a lot of this logic that goes with a menu that says menus know which menu items are actually active currently and stuff like that. Uh, in, in our case, we want to be able to say, you want to build a website, here's Bootstrap. Use Bootstrap to style your website a certain way, right? And um, we also want to say, well, and write something else to style your menus a different way. You can't actually do that here because, for example, some of the menus, not all of them, the new bootstrap that's coming out, some of them are actually divs. They aren't ordered lists. But you see how easy it is to make that mistake. So I liked your um, kind of diagram showing overlapping concepts, um, and I like that it kind of illustrated there isn't sort of necessarily one set of co con concepts which are all distinct from each other. Um, if you if you have a con concept, um, how do you tell if it's a good concept to turn into a class? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's got a lot, it has to do with your insight into the problem. When when you deal with classes specifically, and when you look at the refactoring stuff, the, the other word that I didn't really talk about much here is responsibility. So it's very good if you define a class to say within your code base, what do you want that class uh, to be responsible for? Because it tells you where the methods will be there needed or, or where you would put the methods. Now, in a conceptual model, you don't have that constraint, really, because methods aren't attached to classes. But when you code stuff, you, you need to think about that. So as a rule of thumb, I'd say, well, if you need a lot of responsibility for something, then have a class. But maybe the reverse is more important to say, don't write classes for which you can't give names that map to concepts in your head. Would you say then that our different view of the world, understanding of the world, lead to the many problems that we find in old code or even new code, like your view of the world and my view of the world? I think when you build a system, it's important that you try to make your view of the world that you use to build this particular system explicit in your code because it's the code that's going to survive. And so you, you need to come up with a view of the world that you can explain the most easily to someone. That's sort of my rule of thumb. And the trick comes in if you now change that view of the world. You know, business comes along and says, well, we want to now be able to also uh, work out commissions in this totally different way. I think that's a very tricky thing because then you have to sort of revisit everything you've done and wonder, well, if I make this change and I add this thing to what's already here, there, will the whole again be a sensible view of the world? Because it doesn't really matter what my view of the world is and what your view of the world is. What matters is that the system represents one that we all agree on and that's what you need to maintain. 
Um, do you have any um, examples of nice library you see, like a pip packages, anything like that, where the implementation for a certain problem is like ingeniously simple, makes things a problem like a, a way something works much simpler after you've seen the code, like you understand it much better? Do you have any examples of very clever libraries like that? I'm sorry, no. Okay. <laughs> well, one thing I was, uh, w w w w w one example I was thinking of is um, that uh, WhatsApp library, uh, what's it called again? Yausa or whatever, uh, yeah. Yosap, yes, there we go. That one, uh, for example, I, I think people can look at that because I think it's helped me understand simplification stuff. Well, you, you're welcome to look at our code. I'm not going to promise, you know, reality strikes always, so nothing's ever perfect. But because we're really interested, we think design gives you long-term gains. So if, if you want to discuss it and fight with us, uh, it's good to have differences of opinion about these things and talk about them. You, you're welcome to look at our code and... Tell me what you think. Any other questions? Uh, first of all, thanks. It's a great talk. I think as developers, we often focus too much on how to do something rather than why we do it. I think it's very important. But also for me, a far more important question is, uh, where did you get a copy of The Incredible Machine? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> it's it's very old. I I, I use it for for several purposes. Um, uh, it's it's great to teach people what pair programming is really about. Uh, that it's not about sitting watching someone else code. Uh, so I, I use it for that. But I have got it somewhere. And sorry, don't know. But doesn't Google know everything? Oh. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thanks very much, guys. I um, appreciate it, Ivan, for your talk there. Thank you very much. Just a quick reminder um, after 